All right, good morning. Welcome everybody. You are at the uh, Gila County Cooperative Extension Garden and Country Extension webinar series under the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. And I wanna welcome you to our presentation on biochar kilns and the WUI with uh, Darren McAvoy at the Utah State uh, University. A uh, few things about this webinar series. Uh, it is a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, um, Thursdays at 11 a.m. in Arizona. Um, features a variety of horticultural and natural resources topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. And a recording will be posted at this website, um, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. And the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity, affirmative action. Um, our outline today, uh, we had our kind of login and lag time here starting at 11. Um, welcome, I'm Chris Jones, I'm your moderator. <laughs> uh, Darren McAvoy is gonna be talking here shortly about biochar kilns and some of the applications in the wildland urban interface. We will may have some brief updates and I'll provide an evaluation link. I really appreciate everybody who takes the time to uh, do that little survey for me. It only takes a few minutes and helps to guide what I'm doing and, and sh show that, it, uh, yeah, helps to guide what I do. We'll open it up for some question and answer time with Darren and we'll call it to a close before it's noon. This is your presenter, your presenter, Darren McAvoy, is an Extension Assistant Professor of Forestry at Utah State University. He's a wood product specialist. Okay, so let me um, switch to the other presentation. Darren, how's that look to you? Looks great, Chris. Thank you. You are up. Thank you, Chris. As Chris mentioned, I'm Darren McAvoy. I'm an Extension Assistant Professor here at Utah State University, and I'm the chair of the Utah Biomass Resources Group. I want to talk to you today about the biochar kilns I've been working with since about uh, 2017. Okay, come on. Is that it? Okay, yep, that's it, Good. thank you. Um, and these are our partners, just want to introduce and give credit to all the various partners. There's many more I'll list at the end, uh, but these are our biggest partners and that's our website there, the bottom of the screen. And a lot of the work that I'm going to be discussing today was uh, funded by the Utah Public Lands uh, Initiative Grant. Um, the goals of the project, uh, the biochar kiln project, are obviously to reduce hazardous fuels. And it's important to me as a former firefighter for 20 years uh, to improve firefighter safety. Um, I'd like to be able to create a product at the same time instead of wasting all of this uh, wood material as you see in this photo and this prescribed burn we did here in Utah several years ago. and um, and. It, to, and to try to develop the bioeconomy. I'd like to say pretty much all the photos in this presentation I've taken. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a typical slash pile, um, uh, what we would call a slash pile waste wood. Uh, this is down on the Heber Ranger District in the Uinta National Forest I was looking at just last week. And we're going to try to use our biochar kilns uh, on this project where they would normally just burn these piles. Um, and the issues we have with pile burning, why I'm trying to find an alternative to it, um, include uh, air quality issues, of course, and, and with uh, COVID concerns, air quality becomes very much uh, more important. Um, damage to the soil, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the season that we can burn in is very limited. Uh, we're trying to burn piles due to fire restrictions and air quality restrictions. And where we can burn those piles is very limited. 
Uh, this is some piles I was burning two years ago, helping the Vermejo Ranch in northern New Mexico. And these piles, uh, you can see through the back of the photo, there's a, a bunch of piles through the forest. There's hundreds that we, I think we burned 300 that day, but uh, it took six years for that day to come for the right conditions to all come together so it's pretty elusive and in the meantime these are hazardous hazardous fuels sitting on the landscape and they're uh, emitting carbon uh, as they sit there anyway just as they rot uh, this is sort of the poster child of uh, poor uh, effects, soil effects from pile burning. This is the Flathead National Forest back in the 1980s. Uh, these piles were burned. They were likely machine uh, compacted piles. So the machines, when they logged this, the, the logging equipment just drove right up on the piles and that tends to compact them and put more heat down into the soil. Uh, another factor in that is how dry the soil is. Uh, but uh, the picture there on the right is the, the 1987 and flathead hotshot crew and there on the far top right corner is myself and so the chances are that I might have burned some of these piles on the flathead in 87 that and the ground still beneath has not recovered so this is uh, just one more motivation for me personally to work on this project. Um, and Janique did an excellent job in Chris's great webinar series last week on discussing biochar and what it is and what it can do and how to use it in horticulture. And I'll encourage you to review that or go view it if you haven't seen it yet. But as a quick review, uh, biochar is essentially uh, charcoal. It's charcoal with more of an agricultural intention. Um, and it's mostly carbon. The char I'm holding in my hands here was made by a pretty sophisticated machine. It's about 85 to 90 percent pure carbon and uh, it can be made from any organic material. We've made biochar from at least 30 different kinds of organic material, mostly wood products. And I see it as a balancing mechanism. Um, in some cases we have too much above ground carbon in the form of beetle kill in our forests and the slash piles I've been talking about, um, excess above ground carbon. And any farmland that you look at, um, if it's been tilled, it's lost a lot of carbon. There's a small percentage of carbon that gets lost. It's actually pretty significant every time the ground gets tilled. And so when farmland you see is, is, is light in color like the soil, uh, rocky soil in the background of this picture, uh, that means it's lacking carbon, but when it, it's really dark, that means it has a lot of carbon, it's more productive. And so trying to get more carbon in the soil is a good thing. Um, and uh, I see this as a balancing mechanism, trying to get some of that above ground carbon into a below ground form. And this is super durable, this carbon. It has a half-life of about a thousand years, so it'll last a long time. Um, this is some biochar we made over in Colorado uh, less than a year ago um, uh, with the kilns that I'm going to share with you in the upcoming photos. Um, and just want to again review the process. It is uh, not technically burning the, the material that ends up at uh, as biochar isn't so much burned, but heated by the other wood in the kiln and, and the outside of the, the that the logs that that you see the result of the, ch the resulting char in there. And it's a thermal chemical deep decomposition process. Happens under limited oxygen in the heat range of 400 to 600 degrees Celsius. And I want to let you know, I didn't just start off by burning things in boxes in, in this crude method. I've, I've sort of devolved to this over, over the years. Um, this photo I think uh, is from 19 or from 2010. Uh, thereabouts. Uh, our first attempt, Utah Biomass Resources uh, Group's first attempt at, at uh, wood utilization was this dragon wagon, that's what we called it. It's a mobile gasifier, so it cooks the wood, turns it all into a gas, and we make electricity from it. It was a great project to get us started, but we found it wasn't that practical. It took all the uh, uh, focus and time of the, the person running the machine uh, to, to keep it going. It made enough power to produced two, uh, for two homes or for uh, Utah's first uh, rock concert that we held uh, that was wood fired in, in Beaver, Utah back in I think 2014. Uh, it was an interesting project, but it was not that practical for 
for us. And over time, we moved into this other high-tech approach. This is uh, pyrolysis, uh, mobile pyrolysis in, uh, unit inside of this trailer. And you can see all the equipment that is required to, to pyrolyze the pinion juniper we were working at, uh, working on out in the Nevada desert here in this picture. Um, we demonstrated this machine all over and it's continuing to work on some really promising and, and, and worthwhile things. Um, but we found over time with the cost of this machine and, and uh, our ability to make biochar in simpler ways and, uh, uh, and our focus on biochar, uh, we think there's room for all ends of the market. And so these are our simple flame cap kilns. Uh, they're also called Oregon kilns. I got this idea from a person in Oregon, Kelpie Wilson, who came and gave us our first workshop here in Utah. And I bought my first couple of kilns from, and uh, Kelpie and others are doing this sort of thing in, in other states. Um, and uh, they could, these, they're simple metal boxes that could be made for $800 by any welder. Uh, and some of the fact sheets I'll show at the end, we have the plans for these publicly available. And these kilns are uh, uh, five foot by five foot. Uh, uh, and then they taper down to four foot by four foot. This just makes them stackable. The shape is not terribly important or the size is not terribly important. What is important is that they're contained, that there's no air coming in from beneath. Um, these are about two feet high, so it's easy to throw brush into for people to carry around uh, and uh, to transport them. And so, Four strong firefighters can uh, carry them. They weigh about 200 pounds. Um, we can stack several, several of them on a trailer like this. So they're highly transportable. Um, and the process uh, for doing it, the method, we load the kiln with a rick of logs is the term, just a crisscross pattern. So there is oxygen down in there to get started with, to get the fire going. And dry feedstock works best, but we've seen good success with wet feedstocks, especially if they're a smaller diameter. Um, uh, in Utah, we're able to get away with up to eight or 10 inch diameter material if it's really dry. So we start with by filling our kiln with this feedstock and it, it's helpful to have the fuels uh, pre-cut and sorted by size and, and by length that like we see in this picture. Um, and then we top dress it with uh, kindling, so to speak, small fuels on top. And then uh, it's important to top light uh, the whole thing. And this will create a cap of flames over the top of the kiln that we'll sort of see in our next and our upcoming pictures. And then light it with whatever is available. And we're a big family state here in Utah, so we like that everybody can get involved. Grandpa and the kids can participate in this. Um, I've, I've had lots of different folks participate in it, different workshops, be very hands-on. Um, and then after we top light it, uh, we keep adding fuels. Um, um, and it's like tending a fire. There's some art to it. Um, you, if you put on too much, you will smother it. If you put on too little, it, it'll just burn up the char that you want. And so you keep adding fuels and typically we can add four to eight times the volume of the kiln and fuels before we put the fire out. Um, here, close to the Arizona border, just, uh, just barely north down by uh, Blanding, uh, Utah. A couple of years ago, we were doing this demonstration. It was so dry that uh, we could put 10 times the amount of fuel, the volume of fuel into the kiln. Um, just had to watch it really close. And so we keep burning it down until uh, we get a shift from flaming combustion to glowing combustion, which is what we're seeing here, essentially uh, when the flames die out. At that moment, here we're looking at just a little cap of the white ash in this, but all the rest of it is, is charcoal, is, is coals, so it's ready to be quenched. So we add uh, 100 gallons, or it can be as little as 70, and if you were really um, frugal with your water and did a lot of stirring, you, I'm sure you could do it with less. We have plenty of water on these sites and, and fire engines nearby. Uh, if we're out in the woods, we'll often just use a little four by four with a, with a tank on that. Um, and then we stir it all up to make sure the fire is out and, and that all coals are wet. And this is our finished product. 
a biochar material. Um, I mentioned that uh, higher tech biochar in my uh, in a photo early in the uh, presentation that I was holding in my hands. That was perhaps 85% uh, carbon. In this process, we're ending up with somewhere closer to 70, 60 to 70% 70 carbon. And we preserve about 30% of the carbon that, that is in the forest that, that we put into the kiln. Um, and then strong backs to tip it over. They, uh, a lot of the kilns, our kilns are made with a small hole in the bottom for uh, letting air, letting the water out so it's not so heavy. Um, but you could do this with a, a tractor perhaps uh, if you didn't have people. Um, and the fuller you make it, the heavier it will be, of course. And uh, we make sure we dig a fire line around, if we're in the forest, like here, we dig a fire line around the area, little trail around the area so fire cannot escape. Of course, we would want to do this on windy days or we need a burn permit to do this. So all those things, fire safety has to be taken into consideration, of course. Um, but we're just pulling the, the, the quenched kiln, uh, coals out of the kiln here. And this is, material is really brittle really friable so you can drive over it or break it up with some machinery if you intend to use it for horticultural or agricultural uses back in town um, or if you're going to spread it in the forest it's, it's appropriate to leave it in this large piece size um, I before I spread anything like this in the forest I I would cold trail it that's a firefighters term for just taking a bare hand and, and rubbing it all through the coals and don't do it obviously when they're still glowing red but when you think they're fairly cool make sure that they are and if you can't hold a bare hand next to the coals then they're too hot they need more wetting and more stirring and more time before they're spread out in the forest and we can use several of our kilns at a time i've seen in utah up to nine ten kilns used on one project simultaneously which can increase our productivity. And they have excellent culinary features. The crews really appreciate it on a cold day when we can uh, cook a bratwurst off the side of the kiln like that and, and their uh, eyelets. Um, and as I mentioned, fire safety, you can see around this kiln that's burning. We, uh, even though we're uh, acting and we're working in heavy fuels, very heavy fuels in the forest there, you can see piles there off to the left. Um, but you can also see a fire engine in the background. So we have a charged hose. That means a fully, hard, you know, fully hardened water full of hose ready to go. Um, the pump running, and uh, as I mentioned, we uh, at the end we confirm the fire is extinguished and everything is 100% cool to the touch. And I find the kilns uh, are most useful in sensitive situation where pile burning is impractical. Frankly, it's always going to be less expensive to to burn piles. Light a watt, light a, a match to it, and walk away it is much uh, more economical. But uh, as I discussed, there's air quality issues and soil issues, and uh, we're not preserving any of that carbon. So uh, I think there's a, a certain advantages to this, and, and those include being able to burn when we're in proximity to heavy fuels like this in, in the forest, uh, or in urban wildland urban in, uh, applications, which may be more uh, relevant to this craft. This here, uh, this photo is from November. I did a, uh, I have this special set of these very small kilns that'll fit in the back of my little Toyota pickup there in the background. Um, and uh, this way I can just drive to uh, a surrounding state and give a demonstration. This was for Longmont City uh, last November in Boulder County came and participated in this demonstration and, and workshop that day. And finally, uh, the other sensitive areas where we're seeing these kilns sort of shine is in stream management zones where you cannot uh, burn piles, at least in Utah is, is our uh, best management practices uh, disallow burning piles within stream management zone. So here, this is right next to the Colorado River um, that we're burning these on BLM property. And I happened to just get off a river trip these last few days further up the Colorado River where I saw a lot of piles uh, of Russian olive or we'll try to use these kilns, um, uh, put them in rubber rafts and send them down the river and uh, use them on the riverside. Next slide, please. 
And uh, a hallmark uh, in, of a strong extension program is adoption. When we, when we introduce ideas to uh, people and they uh, run with them, they adopt them. And examples of adoption in Utah include uh, Summit County uh, has their own set of kilns. Utah Sovereign Lands have uh, used our kilns and built some kilns. Um, several private landowners have done the same. Uh, Park City has their own kiln that they use, and uh, Utah Bureau of Land Management has paid to have a set of kilns uh, produced that they will be using on their property and have used on their property. Uh, this is a landowner I'm going to work with. I am working with private landowner Sherm Smoot um, to burn his piles, uh, similar to what I've been showing in, in these photos. And... Um, he uh, has this really unique way of making char on a small scale uh, in his wood stove, as you can see in the background. He told me, he just, I just took this picture a week or two ago, but he found these at some garage sale, these food service trays, stainless steel food service trays. He fills them full of chips and then puts them in his wood stove and builds his, his uh, fire around that on a daily basis. And so he's producing small amounts of char daily for his garden. So there's lots of different ways that we can do uh, char production. Uh, in another way, um, this is, uh, I was invited to give a workshop uh, in, in Boulder, Utah a few years ago, and my kilns were busy in another part of the state, and so I asked what they had, and they had this old cattle watering trough that we repurposed, and it made a great kiln for the day. And as you can see in this photo, we're right next to their house and their garden and uh, fields and other infrastructure. We do have a charged hose and a firefighter ready to go, um, and, and we're paying a lot of attention, but it's pretty windy day and we were able to safely burn in these conditions. A lot of our biochar, a lot of my projects, the biochar will stay on the forest floor. It's completely appropriate to collect some fraction of it and, and bring it down to your garden and your horticultural projects and your agricultural projects. So that's what I often do with mine. But on the forest floor, it has restoration value. It's been shown that charcoal is uh, an important part of forest health in our Western uh, conifer forests. And when we do this, we increase, when we add biochar to our soil, we increase the water holding capacity of those soils. I like to say it's like putting a million sponges into your soils. It's, Char is all about the surface area, the nooks and crannies that hold water and make a great home for bacteria and, and fung uh, uh, helpful fun fungus. So um, uh, this is part of how we change the uh, ecology of our soils by adding biochar. Um, next slide, please. And the Joint Fire Sciences Program is a, a federal program. It's funded by the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, and the Park Service. And they uh, have written up our uh, biochar kiln project under their success stories banner here. You can see a, a example of. And so my concern, I was really excited to get started on this project, but my concern all along was the scale of it as a as a forester, we have big uh, issues in our forests and, and these small kilns it'll take a long time to even make a scratch on it. So, and even with these larger kilns, it will take a long time to make a scratch, but we're, we're scaling up to, to, to attempt that to what I call the, I, I'm calling big box biochar kilns. Uh, we're kind of the first that I know of that are doing this on this, on this scale. Um, uh, anywhere. In some ways, it's very simple. It's sort of like a dumpster fire, like people have been doing out in the back 40 forever. But uh, with the methods that I mentioned and the approach that, I, that we're taking, we can use this as a way to make biochar. Um, this kiln is, uh, is our first demonstration of this. I should say this is all a public lands, Utah Public Lands Initiative grant. And uh, this is our first kiln here near Logan of Providence Canyon. On, uh, they had uh, uh, watershed restoration initiative grant uh, used uh, uh, they used that the Forest Service used this money to cut a bunch of piles uh, cut and pile a bunch of juniper trees and here we're burning them and making biochar out of them last November on the here on the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest Logan Ranger District one of our partners in this project um, this particular kiln is uh, was our first one in single wall construction. It's uh, we call it the BB16 because it's a big box and 16 foot long, and this one is six foot high and eight foot wide. It's 3,000 pounds, and as you can see, we need a big track hoe to be able to load it and and, and tend it. Um, and it was a 
it was a pretty successful first start. In the meantime, what we learned on that, we built our second kiln. This is the BB-12. Uh, this is being uh, at a workshop we did in Moab. Um, this photo is from, from this January, so just a few months ago. Um, or I guess February it was. Um, this one is double wall construction, as you'll see in some of the other photos. And this uh, insulates the inside, gets a little more even heating and better char production. And um, it makes it, more importantly, perhaps makes it easier for the firefighters to, to get up next to, protects them from the heat and protects some of the equipment from the heat. Um, I, this design is informed with, by a partnership by uh, some folks in Oregon, New Creek Land Alliance, and Ken Carloni is a, a, a fellow forestry professor there, and we're working on these projects uh, sort of simultaneously. Um, the BB-12 the BB is easier to handle than the BB-16, at least at the first rendition of the BB-16, because it weighs so much less. And that was part of the intention. This one lays, weighs closer to 2,000 pounds, whereas the other one is 3,000 pounds. This one is much easier to trailer and move around with smaller equipment and it's manageable with a mini excavator that any landowner can operate or firefighters have been operating um, and is available from any rental shop in most towns. Um, and, um, and this is a breakthrough to me because we don't need to hire necessarily a, a separate contractor with a low boy and a great big excavator. This makes it a little bit easier to be nimble, which is really important because we have to act when fire is, uh, when we get a burn permit and when the window is open. Um, there's uh, some more photos of the BB-16 being set up on site in Providence Canyon last year. You can feel the fuels and the surroundings. Um, and it's very important to work with the operators, uh, excellent operators, but don't necessarily have the skills at, uh, at loading the kiln at, at, at the fire end of things, essentially, in the char making. But, uh, everybody we've worked with so far has learned really quick and has been really great attitude and has, has been really helpful. Um, here we are loading the 16 um, and we top it all off just like the small kilns. We top light it just like the small kilns. And I'll point out this, this turned out to be one of the weaknesses in a way of the 16 is that it's six foot high. So you can't even see into it unless you climb up the hill or have a ladder. So we, we thought it was a little better. In the end, uh, I've had this cut down to four feet high. So I think we're gonna, uh, most of our kilns in the future will be that size for accessibility and for uh, the, the less weight makes them a lot easier to uh, manage. And then after, we, after it burns down a while, like tending a fire, like the smell kilns, you add fuels as, as you're allowed to. And you can see the puff of smoke coming out. And you may have noticed in our former, all the other pictures, there's really no smoke coming out of these kilns. I mentioned this flame cap. So all the smoke tends to get, uh, gets consumed as it rises through the flames on the top of the kiln. And then when you add a big puff, big uh, pile of fuel on it like we just did here. You'll get a puff of smoke until it adjusts and settles in and that flame cap re uh, reappears and reforms. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking for grant dollars to quantify this, to have actual research showing that these kilns produce less smoke. But this is a common scene. I'm looking right through the smoke and you can see a little bit of particular matter coming through the kiln that's operating. It's it's at 800 degrees and full of fire right now. You can see in the middle of the photo, a little bit of flames leaping out of there, but it's a, mostly a smoke-free experience that we're finding. And working with the uh, smoke management uh, folks here in Utah have been great. Um, and they actually came and set up this air uh, quality monitoring equipment and right next to the kiln. And, and the air quality here was no different than it was at the station 15 miles north as a comparison. So uh, we're doing pretty good that way. This kiln is very, uh, was challenging to tip over. Took a big machine and uh, touchy that we didn't bend it up too much, but tipped it right over. Didn't turn out to be that much of a problem. Here we are emptying, firefighters emptying the biochar from the kiln. And, and there's some unfinished uh, logs there in the, in the foreground you can see. And those, those are excellent for forest health, be spread out on forest health. And if folks are interested in hygge culture, they, they're 
very popular in other states, uh, in Oregon in particular, for the, those charred logs for hookah culture base. That's a whole different topic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I won't, again, you can see the flame cap acting well here. No smoke coming out of the kiln, hardly. The only smoke is kind of the stuff on the edges that are, isn't fully involved. And, uh, and with minimal embers, some are claiming no embers. I'm not going that far, but I think we can do this when fire hazard is a little higher and you couldn't normally burn piles. Um, back to our Moab demonstration. Um, uh, we used Russian olive was the feedstock here. Again, we're working right along this uh, stream management zone of the Colorado River where you couldn't burn open piles. Um, and this was done on private land. And I'll, I'll point out again, it's a mini excavator uh, being run by the landowner himself in this. And I could point out at the front of this kiln, you can see the little dog door sort of thing at the bottom. That's our trap door for letting the water out at the bottom at the end. So it's not so heavy, a little easier to tip over. Um, lighting the BB-12, a little easier because it's only four feet high, we can reach it. Um, and it's really important to size the kilns to the job. If you have really big fuels and a lot of them, a lot of piles, you might need larger kilns or more of the kilns or a combination of kilns is often what works best. Small kilns to get off in the far corners where the small piles are and harder to get to fuels. And then larger kilns more towards the landing piles if it's an actual logging job or something like that. Trailing the BB-12, again, a lot easier, much more manageable at 2,000 pounds. This is just, uh, well, not in this photo, but I, I can tow this with my towed Tacoma or an F-150, and that was very much part of my strategy to make this accessible to folks with just regular uh, pickups and equipment like that. And Chris, if you go ahead and try and click on this, I have a short video, uh, so a minute or two, give you a better feel, see if this video is active. I'm not sure if that's gonna work. And it doesn't work, that's fine. You can see that on our website. And we could just go back to the presentation. Chris, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that, but I think I got this, I got the screen back up now. Yeah, looks good. And if that video, yeah, I was hoping to run this from my desk and that isn't quite, go ahead, we'll, we'll skip that. We'll just go ahead to the next slide, thank you. And that's available on our website, utahbiomassresources.org. Uh, you can watch that two minute video of this, this uh, kiln in action. Um, the biochar and that we produced here, uh, the landowner wanted for an upcoming uh, nursery project that he was a uh, business plan of his. So he's crushing it up intentionally with the track hoe there, just just mushing it into the into some hard frozen ground there. Um, so pretty crude but pretty effective methods. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of fact sheets that we have uh, on, on these topics uh, on, on restoration and on just using the kilns. The first one there on the left is uh, very similar to what I talked about today. It would be a good review or uh, backup if you want to uh, produce or go in this way. And you can find these on our uh, at forestry.usu.edu. And I have a very long list of partners who I won't read the entire list. Point being, I have more partners than I could ever even describe and I couldn't ever do this alone. None of this is alone. Most of this work really gets done by the people on this list and I'm more of a coordinator of the whole thing. And here's my contact uh, info. Um, please send me an email if you'd like uh, some more information. And I would could even consider the idea of coming to your area to give a demonstration sometime in the future when maybe we're allowed to travel again. Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, let me turn on my video here. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. I'm gonna turn over to some questions here. Um, first, I've got John Martin. John, I'm gonna give you, promote you so you can talk. You were asking what, what in the handheld red tank to ignite? So yeah, he had just a few questions from the talk if you're able to recall what those were. So John, yeah. I'll unmute you here. Go ahead, John Martin. 
Uh, sure, I was just wondering the chemical that was used in the red handheld type to ignite the fire. Yes, that is a, a tool is called a drip torch, standard firefighting equipment. Um, arguably the most common ignition device and we it's a mixture of uh, uh, three to one or four to one as gas to diesel or I should say diesel to gas mostly Good. mostly diesel a <laughs> little bit of gas depends how flashy you like it and how you're as far as the mix three to one or four to one does that answer your question right the reverse would be undesirable i should imagine yeah, it'd be flashy <laughs> you'd, you'd be running very fast through the woods if that's what you were carrying behind you you bet and how'd you get the bin up on the flatbed what you got it just a winch that you cranked down or it's a yeah. tilt bed yeah, great question. I, I was very much worried about that, how we're get, get, going to get it on and off the flatbed. I think we can, I was tender about it, getting it off since it was our first time. I think we could just tie it to a, an old uh, a post or gently to a tree and, uh, and drive away and let it fall on the ground for unloading it. For loading yeah. it, yeah. Um, I was impressed with the landowner. He had no problem loading and unloading it by building a crib of, of he had some four by fours and he kind of made a crisscross or like a Rick, like I did um, just a Lincoln log uh, four, four by four sort of squared around and, and okay. built it up to that level. And, and so he lifted one end and set it on that. And then and that's how he loaded and unloaded the kiln. Very good. You mentioned burning Russian olive. Uh, that's an invasive in British Columbia. Is it an invasive down in your neck of the woods as well, Absolutely. Darren? Absolutely. We have so much of it. It's a huge problem here. It, it, it's, it's, their heart is a rock. Hard yeah. to cut. They make good biochar, though. Okay. We've, done, we've done a lot of biochar projects from the Kurlu National Grassland, where we are making biochar to grow better... Uh, habitat for the it's critical habitat for the monarch butterflies it's breeding oh. ground surprisingly just over the idaho border from here and uh and so we're trying to grow better forbs and pollen and milkweed uh for the butterflies there from russian olive char and a whole bunch yeah. of others i make a lot from tamarisk too i don't know yeah. i don't think it goes that far north does it uh, uh, salt cedar is its more common name here and and we do a lot of uh, tamarisk invasive species. Uh, you know, such a win to do invasive species. Uh, 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 it's already a win, in my opinion, because we're producing carbon and we're not uh, producing as much smoke. Um, yeah. uh, and if we can do this with invasive species, then we're way ahead. It's a double win. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thanks for your question. Thank you for taking them. Excellent presentation. Thanks so much. Okay, the next person I've promoted up for a question is Erica. And she had a question in the Zoom box. So Erica, you are, un unmute yourself and you can ask Darren. Hi, um, we do a lot of camping and we do a lot of backyard campfires. Um, I'm involved in a community garden down here and I have my own personal one. So what should the finish product look like? How do I know I'm doing it right? Great question. It should be black, 100% black all the way through. It should be brittle. Uh, it should look like coals. It should, I mean, the, the, when we buy Kingsford charcoal briquettes, they tend to have petroleum and coal products in them. So it's, they're not as refined as that, but um, it is that sort of material. And you can absolutely use this for your barbecue. In fact, oh, before I even heard the term biochar, I think I went to, uh, uh, Chris and I work in extension and one of our colleagues at our national meeting in North Carolina was talking about how there, if you're really into barbecue, you don't just make your own dry rub or your own sauces. You make your own charcoal too so he's doing exactly kind of the same thing that we're doing so it should look like coal so at the end of the you know when you put your fire out erica um at the end uh, that's that's and you have unburned material in there and if you reach in and take one of those sticks that's unburned the next day when it's cooled off and you break it open and it's black all the way through that's biochar if it's white on the edge, that's ash. Um, and if it's uh, still brown inside, not completely uh, cooked, we would call that probably torrified wood. Um, so there's different sort of grades of, of, of combustion uh, completeness there. So it's pretty straightforward. If it's brittle and friable and black and you can break it into small pieces, that's char. Um, 
I believe that was the same question you had, Rich. Did he answer your question or you need to ask that in any other way? Actually, I, I was gonna ask it slightly differently. Um, most of the reading that I've done about biochar, it's all been made in a zero oxygen environment in a, in a totally enclosed container with maybe a, you know, a small, small pinhole kind of thing to let out the gases. Um, what yeah. Was, and, and they always made quite a distinction between charcoal and biochar. And I, I guess I'm trying to remember exactly what the distinction was there. I guess the biochar maybe was a more pure form of carbon or something. But is there can you Great questions. That? Um, it's the second one first, uh, difference between charcoal and biochar. Essentially, it depends who you talk to. A lot of times people will say it's exactly the same. The difference would be charcoal would be cooked slightly less. You, you'd be okay leaving some of those volatiles on the outside of your charcoal and that would get your fire going, um, and be okay, uh, for cooking because they would burn off early on, probably before, before you put your, your meat on or whatever. But, um, uh, char, at char, we don't want that on it. So we cook the char just slightly longer. Uh, and we had that problem early in our sort of process. We were with the more high tech machines. We didn't cook the char long enough. We left too many volatiles on there. So if there is a difference, and it depends who you talk to and what definition you're looking at. Um, uh, it, it is, uh, it's those volatiles on there. And in fact, I've taken my biochar from the big box uh, project in Providence Canyon uh, and used it as charcoal. I went up after hours and had some friends over and, and had a big barbecue and barbecued a bunch of salmon and chicken uh, with, with juniper coals. That was kind of fun. Um, and the zero oxygen question comment. Yes, good point. It's very little oxygen is allowed to make a char. And this surprisingly is a very low oxygen environment. Let me say how, because that flame cap partly that goes across the top of the kiln doesn't allow, it limits any oxygen that can come down. It can only be sucked in through the sides of the kilns. And what's going down, going on inside of the kiln, inside of one of those logs is the outer portion of the log is burning off. That's just open combustion with oxygen, but no oxygen is getting, or not enough oxygen is getting into the center of that log to cause complete combustion. So it's that, those subtleties that, that allow us to make biochar, uh, charcoal in this crude form. And again, you know, it's not as high a carbon count um, in, our, in, in, in high end machines uh, that are made for this that cost $500,000 usually at least. Um, your char can be, should be up to 80, 90% pure carbon. And these crude methods, we're looking at 60, 70% pure carbon, but it costs so much less and it's so much more accessible. Does that answer your questions? Yes, very, that did very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up, uh, if you go into the chat box, I provided an evalu a link to the evaluation. Um, if any of you have done this before, it only takes about 60 seconds, two minutes, you know, if you add a little extra information, but just gives me an idea how the talk went and a little bit, yeah, just a little bit of information for me. Darren knows all about us having to evaluate our programs, so this is good. And um, Kristen, I've promoted you to, yeah, you're ready to go. So Kristen, you're up. Thanks, I've done a couple of Zoom meetings in my lifetime. Um, I was just wondering, um, I'm familiar with the Arizona publication 1752 um, regarding making and using biochar for gardens in Southern Arizona. Um, is that a good resource to use as well in these situations? Um, I have never really recommended it. I don't think I've seen a lot of people in Maricopa County using biochar. Um, again, the alkaline soil over here are one of the biggest concerns. Right, and um, is the UA publication you're talking about the one that uh, Janique Artiola wrote? Yes, Dr. Car Artiola. Yeah. So we had Janique present for us last week. Oh, I missed it. I'm sorry. And I, just just shoot me an email. I haven't got it posted to the website yet, but I will send you that link and you can watch it. Okay, great. Um, I'll go ahead and do that. What we learned from Janique is that 
it, it needs to be thoroughly washed. So it's gone through one wash system the way um, Darren is doing this because he's cooling it down. That releases a lot of the salts and, and, uh, and, and you know, salts that are going to drive up the pH. So th those, are, those are the real issues. So he's suggesting to give it a, a few washes. And when you do put it into our um, semi-arid desert soils, it will raise the pH and the salts temporarily. It should wash out and then start to have its benefits. So I think your most sensitive plants may be an issue. He said, be careful about how much you're putting out and mixing into your, like a vegetable garden where you've got some lettuce or other types of species that are gonna be really sensitive to um, salts and pH. Um, and, uh, and that's what I recall. Some other people were on the call with me on that, but um, I will send you that presentation and you'll hear it again. Thanks. And Thanks, he, Chris, Alex. And uh, uh, Janique did a great job of also emphasizing in a lot of cases we want to put the char in our compost and let it absorb, especially a wetter compost mix, absorb the, the nutrients and the moisture from those. Because uh, as I said, it's an empty sponge. If you put it raw on your soil, it can set back your productivity for the first year or two while it absorbs uh, nitrogen and other things from your soil. So uh, good to mix it. Uh, and with fertilizer or compost first. Um, good. And, and Bill, you put into the chat, chat box. So just above that where I put, please complete the evaluation, that's, that's the evaluation link. So click on there and you'll help me out with uh, the evaluation. Um, wait to see if I got some more questions here. Okay, then I'll start. And if you've got questions, please, enter it into the quest Q and A or the chat box. I'll promote you to um, allow to speak and, and ask that question. But Darren, what I want to ask you, cause we're gonna have to be winding down here soon. This has been great. Um, as have you worked with any of uh, like a county landfill, you know, some of the wooey situations where this may be a good opportunity to divert um, fuel that could go into the landfill, you know, otherwise they're burning it, you know, making ash out of it. And then we may have an opportunity as biochar as some type of product. Great question, Chris. I've tried. Uh, I have not yet been successful. I've knocked on several doors. Maybe I haven't knocked on the right one yet. Um, I will keep trying. As a previous uh, speaker mentioned, nobody's really heard of biochar yet. So when you go show up at the dump, talking, you know, I'm a researcher and I do biochar stuff. They don't, uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten much cred yet, um, but I'll, I'll keep trying. Well, it's something I'd like to try to do in, in my county and why I'm doing some of these, these talks to learn and share and get ready to talk with ours because we're dealing with those issues. Um, it, se it seems like such a no-brainer to me because I mean I, I first I, I started like uh, approaching the dumps asking for old dumpsters that I could use as kilns because they could probably make pretty decent kilns and I found even that hard to get their old dumpsters out of them um, let alone get them to start making char um, but I'll keep working at it. Yes. <laughs> It's all, all starts with a relationship, I guess. That's right. it's true. Okay. Um, again, I'm gonna ask for, sort of, if people have more questions, please put that into the Q&A or the chat box and I'll promote you to where you can ask it. I'm going to put up a couple of my ending slides here. Make sure I've got the right one. Why am I showing two presentations? I think this is the one. Okay, so thank you, Darren. Um, when I do these webinars, we don't have the ability to give that audience feedback where they can give a clap or a thumbs up, but I'm sure the whole audience is, is clapping and showing great appreciation. Thank you. Um, again, I put that uh, webinar link in the, in the chat box. So if you got a, an opportunity to do that, I really appreciate it. Um, just want to let you know that our next presentation will be um, at 11 o'clock Arizona time again. 
Our presenter is Dr. Ed Franklin. He's a professor of agriculture education at the University of Arizona. And he's been doing a lot of education about solar energy, a lot with our um, 4-H um, youth. And just know he does a lot of off-grid type of uses and like to learn more about rooftop and working with companies uh, and, and doing that type of stuff. So that will be our next presentation. I'll be taking the week of the first week of July off for the uh, 4th of July weekend and be presenting, um, letting people know what the July webinars are soon, very soon. Um, that's it. Okay. Good job, Chris. If we don't have any more questions for, for Darren, we're going to bring this to a close. Well, people are saying they can't see the questionnaire. Hmm. When, when you click on that button, this is what should come up. It says, H, I'll, I'll put it in there one more time. It's right there in the, in the chat box, forms.gle slash whatever. And it'll just ask a few questions for you there. So really appreciate that. Um, everybody have a great um, afternoon and um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We'll bring this presentation to a close. I'm going to hit end on the recording and see you all next week. Take care.